Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's live. Um, this morning, we're going to be chatting about lighting. Now, lighting is something that makes a massive difference to the atmosphere and the ambience of a space and actually to how you feel in the space. So it's so important to get right, yet it is something that, you know, we see people making an awful lot of mistakes with. So this morning I have invited Rocky Wall of Wink Lighting to join me uh, just to get some of his expertise and insights to help you guys decide how best to light your home. And we'll try and keep it as practical as possible and share a few images as well so that it's uh, easy to, to understand. So I'm going to invite Rocky to join now. So just waiting. So just waiting for Rocky. It's a little bit slow this morning. So just while we're waiting for Rocky to to join, just to chat about you know the different kinds of lighting. Um, like there's so many ways to light a space, and it's not just about uh, recessed spotlights and filling the space with as many lights as possible. In actual fact, what we find is. When it comes to lighting, less is more, especially with overhead lighting and ceilings. So what's really important when you're trying to decide on how to light a room, it's to try and build up as many different light sources as you can have. So things like lamps are really important. Look for dark corners in a space. Um, so what you want to be able to do is try and control the atmosphere as much as possible. So I think I see Rocky now. I'm just going to invite him to join. So Rocky, if you just want to send me a request to join, or I can see if I can let you in. Hang on. So Rocky, this might work hopefully. Oh, he's declined. So Rocky, you just need to accept it <laughs> unless you've changed your mind. Hang on. How are you doing? Hi, Rocky. Good morning. How are you? Very good, thanks. How are you? Great. Good. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. No problem. Brilliant. So look, I was just I saying... You look, you're looking a lot better than I am. <laughs> I don't know about that now. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, I was just saying in the intro, just the effect that lighting can have on a space, you know, and how important it is to get the lighting right. Yet it's something that is very easy to make mistakes with. Um, so just to try and... I suppose this morning what I'd love to do for people is maybe if we could run through, you know, the, the different uh, areas of the home and then help people understand what kind of lighting works best in the different areas. Sure, no problem. Yeah. Well, I suppose the way we would approach a project is that you start at the front door and then working from the front door, you work through the house. So yeah. <clears throat> even as you enter into a home, light can have a great effect or a good effect or a bad effect. And maybe that is the first place that people can often make a mistake, as in the type of light that you have at your front door. So you could have a very warm color temperature light, which is very inviting. People look really well. Or you can have a very cold looking color temperature. And by color temperature, I mean, and it might be an opportunity just to show this now, is that <clears throat> I might demonstrate it here, is if you have a cold color temperature and on my face now, I have a cold color temperature. And if mm -hmm. you have a warm color temperature, you can radically change the perception of how somebody looks. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine you open up your front door and everybody's looking tasty and pale and horrible, it's not a very white, nice way to invite people in. You don't look well, they don't look well. So, mm -hmm. you know, ensuring there even that you do it right makes a big difference. Sure. So then moving from there, you move into the hall. And the hall is always a place that I say to people, that, you know, you can be a bit more experimental. It's trans. Transient space, nobody's spending much time there. You can <clears throat> do a bit of fun if you want to have a feature fitting or if you want to have a feature combination of lighting. Or you can have more subtle lighting with, you know, five amps and lamps and everything like that. Hmm. And then you're into each space. And I suppose that we've spoken about this before is that the way we approach lighting is using a floor plan and not necessarily using a reflected ceiling plan because what you're doing is you're illuminating what's happening on the floor, whether it be a sitting room, a dining room, a kitchen, 
Mm. A bathroom, it's always what's on the floor is what's been illuminated. So each mm. space would be taken individually and you try and work mm. out what does everyone want to do in this room? So if it's a TV room, you know, you're going to be reading much, what sort of ambience you want. And again, then, as you said in your intro, lighting is all about layers mm. and layers of light. So you, you won't, don't necessarily want to be dependent solely on one source of light. So you don't want, let's say, all down lights, or you don't want one central light if it's a living room only, because you want to be able to have flexibility for the different activities that you're going to have in that space. Sure. So you'd have some table lamps, and wall lights, et cetera, et cetera. So mm. then you move through into a kitchen, and a kitchen, as and we all I know, is the heart of the home. Rocky, can I just, maybe we'll slow down a little bit because I know there's so much information there. So just to kind of, I want to just go back to what you were saying about when planning the lighting and looking at the floor plan. And I guess just to kind of further explain that to people, what that (laughs) means is think about the furniture layout in the room. So for example, if you're lighting, you know, lighting an open plan space, you want to think about where's the dining table going? Where's the sofa going? And and plan your lighting around that. Because for example, what, what can be really uncomfortable is, sitting directly under a spotlight, for example. So you just want to really think about the, the subtleties of that. Um, and, you know, plan your lighting to illuminate certain things. Um, I know we've talked before about maybe even taking artwork. So say like the piece behind me, I have tiny little spotlights. Um, I might just try and move this so you can see it. So I don't know, they're probably really far away, but I just sort of put really small spotlights just to illuminate that. So I don't have loads and loads of lights in the ceiling. But what it means is at night time, that's illuminated. It's a lovely feature in the space, but really effective. For well, if I just pick well. that point there with spotlights, and mm. I suppose there has been a lot of errors in the way to how spotlights have been used. So spotlights are downlights, mm-hmm. as the term said, it's a spot. It should be used to illuminate a painting, an object, they were never designed to be spatial illuminators, mm-hmm. as in you have 15 downlights in a room to light the room, which mm-hmm. is absolutely crazy. So ensuring that when using downlights or spotlights, they're used for that particular task. And as mm-hmm. you say, at night, then that becomes a feature as opposed to just a big splurge of light everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, like in my own house, I think I have three downlighters. That's it. Really? Yeah. And they're, yeah. Yeah, we don't I just, they're, <clears throat> you can create so many nicer bits of illumination mm-hmm. without having to litter the room with spotlights. Definitely. Well, it's, it's funny. My brother always refers to them as the emergency lighting. So they're the sort of thing you only put on in an emergency. <laughs> you can't find something. And he's right because it's, you know, it's, it's not a nice way to relax. So ultimately you're turning on the lights in the evening time. That's the time you're winding down. You want to chill out. So you yeah. want the room to, to feel like it's a space you can relax and not, not to feel like you're, you know, on display. So no, yeah, down lights, completely agree, completely agree. So then Rocky, I might just jump into a couple of images because you've sent me some fabulous images um, and maybe even just to chat about, like I know we were talking about how not all lighting needs to be on show. So I guess when people think of light, they think about the fitting, but sometimes it's about thinking, how do I want the space to be lit and and working that way? I need some really nice, uh, you know, ideas and and ways to achieve that. The funny thing with the advent of LED lighting and because it's becoming um, so small, but very bright, Mm. there are all sorts of um, products that have been produced now to specifically um, house and uh, facilitate LED, especially especially the tapes. Mm. So with the tapes now, we would do an awful lot of work where it's at first fix. So for those who may not know what first fix is, it's when the building is getting the plasterboard put up. It's before the plasterer skims the walls. And these products become a building material. Mm -hmm. So instead of being putting a wire in a ceiling and then putting a fitting onto that wire, you're actually installing this product at the very early stage. So it becomes um, almost hidden as a fitting, but it becomes a major light source. So that's a big change. And I think that might be what you're saying. I like the image you have there of the stairs. The handrail is recessed into the stairs. The light 
is in the handrail. It lights the stairs as well, mm-hmm. but it gives you this really lovely feature then at night time. That's right. And I suppose that the point here with these kinds of fittings, they're definitely not an afterthought. They're not something that can be retrofitted. So oh, no, no. You no, have to no, start no. planning as early as possible. And I think that's that's the important thing. I mean, it really is the case with almost everything. The earlier you start planning, uh, the more control you're going to have and the more opportunity to build some of these details in, in a way that's affordable as well, you know, because the earlier you start sort of trying to factor these things in, the easier it's going to be to implement them. Well, just on that point, we would get a lot of various different um, requests for projects at various different times. So the earlier that we're involved in the project, the better it is for the outcome because Mm -hmm. we can then ensure that all of the lighting, scheduling and design is in Mm pre-tender. So what happens often is that people will come to us with a lighting layout. They're just about to start. The electrician is going on site next week. Mm -hmm. And we look at it and we sort of have a shock. Mm -hmm. And then you have to decide, well, what are you going to do? And the problem that can arise there then is that the lighting layout or the lighting design will be completely different to what was tendered. And then the client and the project can suffer because the electrician then will turn around and say, well, hang on, this is going to cost you X, Y, Z, and you don't have it included. Mm -hmm. So the earlier we're involved from a design point of view, the better it is for everybody because then there's no shocks that come down the trail. Mm -hmm. You ensure that all of what we're discussing here, this first fix element is included the builder knows about it because there's building works involved. Mm. So yeah, definitely the earlier, the better for sure. Sure. And, and in budget as well, you know, so you, you guys, yeah. you have an opportunity yeah. to move yeah. things around. I suppose I show Absolutely. this image here. This is another sort of ceiling detail, uh, recess ceiling detail. This kitchen actually was internal. So tricky to light, but then, you know, there was a view through from the sitting room to that kitchen area beyond. So pendant lights would have really uh, interrupted that view. So we just sort of played around with, with this sort of detail and it worked worked really well. Um, and those deep, this is another one that isn't really showing, but again, you know, it can work in living spaces too. So um, yeah, there's lots and lots you can do with the LED. And then I think coming back to the color temperature with LED, because that's another mistake that I see that unless you specify oh. what you want, you can get that really, really cold and clinical LED. And it just well, I'll tell you where, it, yeah, where, where it comes a cropper big time is also is let's say we specify and supply in a specific type of LED, and we would be mm. very um, how to put it uh, conscious and aware of the color temperature that we want to use for a specific task, mm. and then you have a furniture manufacturer or a kitchen maker, he will buy his LED, puts it into the kitchen fit out, and it's a completely tonal value different to what's in the rest of the room. Mm. So it's any, then you have this mishmash of color, which just looks so badly planned. And we would always say, look, whoever you get it from doesn't really matter, but just make sure all of the LED that's going into one space is coming out of the same manufacturer's box because mm-hmm. then you know they're all going to be the same color temperature. Mm-hmm. As even if you have it, that it could be that really hard white light and then you've got a warm color and then you could have another color. Like I was in a kitchen one time and for whatever reason, there was two different furniture manufacturers supplying two different pieces of fitted furniture and they had two different tapes and we had a tape. So suddenly there was all this mishmash of stuff going on and it was just terrific. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good point, actually. Mm. And I show this kitchen here because you'll see uh, the pendant lights and the lighting, then the under counter lighting are the same tone. And that's that's exactly yeah. what you're saying, Rocky. And it's not something people think about. You know, you think about matching paint colors or matching your fabric to other things. But when it comes to light, you're not thinking about matching the light color. Um, so it yeah, is really yeah. important. Uh, and like I remember... And I, just sorry... It, if you go back to the picture the one you just showed before where the internal kitchen and you have that coffer detail yeah if what we would often do so let's say you're struggling for daylight it doesn't look like you're struggling for daylight in this particular kitchen but sometimes mm-hmm. deep kitchens can be quite dark so on a winter's evening you know when it's very dull outside 
this is a place where you could use that dynamic white light in the coffer. Mm -hmm. So during the course of the day, that light would have a daytime color temperature to it. Very good. And then when you switch it on at night, it would automatically always come on in a warm color temperature and then maybe dim down. Mm -hmm. Another place where we would use that combination a lot is, you know, if you uh, look at old um, Terrace Georgian houses where the kitchen would have been in the, there would have been staff and the staff lived in the basement. But a lot of people, when they're converting them into family homes now, they put everything in the basement. They put the kitchen because it's at ground level, but they're the darkest spaces there are. And oh, more times than not, people have the lights on all day. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, we would really use this kind of using a daylight supplemented mm. through artificial light, but in that color temperature. Sorry, it's just... Yeah, no, that's really interesting. So you can actually replicate the feel, the look and feel of daylight, even if you've got quite a dark space. Um, yeah, so yeah, well... Uh, the ambience. Yeah, 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 for sure. We did, actually, this is on a, a commercial project. The Shelburne Hotel's reception is in the core of the building. Mm -hmm. So they put in these lay lights to look like windows, and we backlit them with this daylight thing. And actually, you know, they work... Very effective. So during the course of the day, the rows look like it's daylight, then they tone right down and they're dim. They never go off because it looks too dark. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there you go. Brilliant. So I see a question, Rocky, has just come in. Um, a lady, not a fan of ceiling lights at all. How would you recommend lighting an open plan living area without them? Well, our living area, we've no ceiling lights at all. We've all fire bams. And what we did there was in the five amps are split up onto three different circuits. So can you, so sorry, you, can, Rocky, dim, can you explain what a five amp is just in case people don't? My know. apologies, my apologies. Yes, okay. So um, what happens in, if you want to uh, control your lighting from a switch point, mm -hmm. you use a, a socket that is different to your conventional uh, three pin 13 amp socket, which would be on all your appliances like your Hoover or your kettle. Mm -hmm. So the five amp is, 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 is different. And the reason it's different is that if you were to use just a standard 13 amp socket and switched it through a dimmer on the wall, and then someone came along and plugged a Hoover into it, you'd blow the dimmer up. Okay. So that's the reason why, and then they're protected in a different way. Okay. So in essence, the five amp uh, is then, so it's controlled from you walk in the door, you turn on the lights and all the lights come on in the room. Mm -hmm. But if you split the circuit up, so you uh, let's say you split the room, depending on the size of the uh, room, this lady's asking, is that you could have it that, you know, you have one light source that's a very high output light source and it's controlled separately to the others. So you can dim them and regulate and get the tonal value. And with table lamps and floor lamps, the, um, the immense amount of variety that's out there it's possible to be able to combine them to make any kind of light source. Or in our dining room, often we would just, you could use two, you know, wall lights, but ensuring that the wall light has the output to be able to illuminate the room. So mm -hmm. you can't just have it that you put a wall light up. So you could have a wall light that generates no illumination. So specifying the right type of lamp or light output that goes into any particular fitting is crucial. Mm -hmm depending on what the task is that you're mm -hmm. trying to have that light source to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why dimmers are so great because it, it'll allow you to adjust yeah. and yeah. Yeah, yeah, and control that light source, which is brilliant. And yeah. actually Rocky, like, you know, even if somebody's not doing a massive job, that's a really simple switch um, that people can make and it'll just oh, allow you to control, yeah. you know, so yeah. just swapping out those switch plates to dimmers um, is a great yeah. idea. Well, even talking on that control, like the new control on the block, if you want, I can talk about that is Bluetooth and Bluetooth is um, controlling lighting without any cabling. So you still have your 230 volts, your mains cables going to your light source, but with a switch that has no battery, has no cable, has no connection to anything other than you nominate what the switch might do. So, this is very simply one here and what you press a button and by the physical energy, the kinetic energy of pressing the button is enough to turn on and off 
a light source. Mm -hmm. So the, the big advantage to this is that every kind of producer is getting involved in it. So even down to you can buy a Bluetooth bulb from Ikea. So if that lady didn't have, let's say, uh, a five amp circuit in her house, mm. you could buy a Bluetooth switch with all Bluetooth bulbs. And then you could do what I was saying. You could have, have them up at different light levels and change them and swap them around. Mm. So it's a really, really simple way of getting a very lighting control system in your house uh, affordably. Very affordably. And I mean, there's Philips yeah. Hue as well. I remember getting a present of, imagine getting a present of a light bulb, Rocky. You'd probably love it. But, <laughs> and that's so clever. So again, it's Wi-Fi yeah. enabled and I could change. No, no, color. no. Yeah. Well, well the Philips it, Hue. It was no. Di no, this is different. Yeah, it is. Like well, no, the Philips Hue is Bluetooth, actually. Is it Bluetooth? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I, the subtle, there is a, a difference. And the big reason the difference is I'm not a big fan of Wi-Fi because if the Wi-Fi goes down, you don't have control, okay. whereas Bluetooth is completely independent of anything. As long as you've got power, you've got your Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have power, you can't have a light anyway. So, you know, it's a much more um, secure way. And then from a programming of any of the Bluetooth devices is that everyone has a Bluetooth controller in their pocket, you know, a phone, your mobile phone. So there's a very simple app. So and, and it's designed to be idiot proof, you know, yeah. so. But what was lovely about this, uh, the bulb as well, like if you go on holidays or something, you could just operate it from your phone for it to come on in the hallway or whatever. So yeah. they're really, really clever and, you know, pretty inexpensive, as you say, uh, which is great. And we have another question, Rocky, just pendants or spotlights over an island, yes or no? I just say... Well, there's two things there. It depends on where your dining table is, I always say. So if you've got a dining table that's very close to your island, hanging pendants over both could look very cluttered. Yeah. So you would say, okay, will we go pendant over the dining table or pendant over the island? And, and if you go one or the other, then the spots would take the place of whichever it isn't. But if you've got a generous space where you know, your, your table and your island are, are you know, a good bit apart, well, then, so, you know, you could go both. I generally would advise people one or the other because I think sometimes if you, depending as well as how you enter your kitchen, mm. if you've got this cluster of lighting hanging all over the place, is it can be, I mean, in the lighting showrooms here, what's going on, you know? So, mm. And then what you can do is you can afford maybe to spend more on a, you know, a nicer light source if you're only going to go over one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. And, and it makes more impact because otherwise it starts to yeah. detract from the impact of the one sitting. So. Well, they can conflict with each other as well, okay. you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Rocky, for people just like, even if you're out shopping for bulbs, because I remember, and I think we talked about this before, but I remember years ago going uh, on holidays and staying in this little holiday cottage and all of the light bulbs were those older um, energy efficient bulbs that were really cold. And I just yeah. had to go out and replace them all because I just couldn't cope with sitting in the space because it was so uncomfortable to be in um yeah. and I, is, how do you know because there is a an indication on the box to let people know so what, okay what well for? well there's two things i would always say about bulbs and people buying bulbs if you don't recognize the manufacturer's name on it don't buy it okay. because there's an awful lot of rubbish out there so you know buy in by solace which is irish or you buy phillips or you buy osram kind of a name that has a brand and if the box doesn't have any name it means the people who ever made it aren't proud enough to put their name on it. So definitely don't buy that one. Okay. So from a color temperatures, which we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. earlier is um, it's measured in degrees Kelvin and it comes from heating iron actually. And Kelvin was an Irish engineer. So it's ha the measurement, it's the, the warmth or the coolness of the color of white light. And the higher the number, the cooler the color temperature. Mm -hmm. So for residential homes, we would always be going anywhere from 2,400, which is a very warm color temperature, as maxing 2,700. So on most product boxes, they'll have that number if they're a quality product. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they'll say warm white or cool white. Now, that's a very broad 
statement sure. and yeah, you yeah. could get anything on it. Mm. So when we would specify a light source with our specification, we would always specify the color temperature. Okay. And more and more now, let's say it, people were going more towards the 2400, which would be much closer to the old filament lamps that we had. And if you take light from the very beginning, light, you know, the sun is burning, a fire was burning, a candle was burning, everything was all about uh, that color temperature in mm -hmm. fire. And even a filament lamp, the filament was glowing and that's why you got that heat. So a filament lamp was only 10% light efficient, the rest of it was generating heat. So now with the advent of LED, the technology is completely different mm. to generate light. It mm -hmm. is a chip, it's a, you know, it's a printed circuit board. So the color specification becomes even more critical. So in, if, if, you can, if the lamp has a number on it, you want that number to be 27 or below. Okay. So 2700K or below. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, no, that's great advice because it is, you're absolutely right. Like I have bought things that say warm, warm white, particularly uh, fairy lights and stuff at Christmas time and you bring them home and they're not, they're, they're almost icy. And they're blue. Yeah, yeah, they're blue, yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's awful. So and that's really good. That's really, really good. And then Rocky, just um, so if we take different areas of the home, uh, just tips for people for lighting, like take, for example, what we've all been faced with uh, more recently is working from home and how best to, to light that space that we can do without having to rip the room apart, you know, so I suppose for task lighting and things like that. Yeah, well, Tassa, there's two things again, then if we go back to this color temperature. Mm. Now, color temperature will stimulate the mind in different ways. So if you take a cool color temperature, which may be up at three or 4,000 or more, mm -hmm. Kelvin, in an office space, the specification would be 4,000 Kelvin, right? And the reason for that, or even more, a higher, I should say, is that the mind finds it easier to concentrate in a daylight kind of scenario or a cooler color temperature. And it, it finds it you'd be more productive. So if you put in a really warm color, yeah, yeah, if you put a warm color temperature, into, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about that in a minute, but mm -hmm. if you put a warm color temperature into an office space, subconsciously what you're saying to the mind is, it's time to wind down, okay. right? Yeah. So you would never, so in an office, I would often say to people is, with the lamp, a table lamp, desk lamp that you have, mm -hmm. go for a cool color temperature. Okay. So that when you're in there and you're yeah. trying to, you're helping the mind to concentrate. So we did a project once with Trinity and there you have, um, uh, in the, the art block there built in the 70s, mm. it, uh, you know, auditoriums that have no natural daylight whatsoever. Wow. They're ventilated, you know, they're big, big auditoria. So I, we went in there and the color temperature on the, in there was about 2.7 or not 2.4. It was really, really warm. Mm. So you were asked what was happening. People were going in there. They were sitting there sometimes maybe for an hour or more. Mm. And by the time they were struggling, they were falling asleep. So when you put in a cool color temperature, what you're doing so consciously to the mind is you're, you're giving it, a, saying it's awake, so concentrate. And uh, it, we were chatting at the door one time with the facilities guy talking about doing the other rooms. Mm. And this lecturer walked in and he said, do you guys change the lighting in here? And they said, yeah. And he says, it's just amazing. The difference it has made for me and the kids in the in the room is dramatic. Isn't that incredible? So, yeah. yeah, so if you're spending a lot of time in a room that doesn't have a lot of natural light mm. at home, and as you say yourself, down lighting onto a desk is a horrible way to light a desk because you get very hard shadows. You get in your own shadow if you're you know, leaning over. And most people now are working on a computer anyway, so it's self-illuminating. Yes, exactly. So it's ensuring that if you're, if you need artificial light and you're trying to concentrate, so let, let's say someone's working late at night, mm. to help yourself and to help your mind perform and last longer at the task, have a cooler color temperature lamp. 
That's fascinating, Rocky. And actually, I have experienced that sitting in a room that would have been quite warmly lit and feeling a bit drowsy after a while. So really fascinating. Well, it's funny, I can share a, an image with you, but if you take daylight mm. and color temperature and how it works, so you start in the morning, like the, the brightest time of the day and the easiest time of the day for us all to concentrate, there's larks and owls, but most people are are larks. So they... Mm. It's, it's the middle of the day. That's the best time because it's the brightest. Mm. So it's, and it's the easiest for us to, to perform. Mm. Like you, also in light level, yeah. like light is measured in lux, so L-U-X. So in an office space, we would strive to have 500 lux on the working plane. Mm -hmm. But on a bright sunny day, it's 100,000 lux outside. My God. Yeah, so that will yeah. show you how much light we can actually manage. Our eyes are just amazing how they can change and adapt. No, so light level on the desk. If you're doing paperwork, you should always ensure that you have loads of light. Because if you don't have light, loads of light, what happens is your eyes will strain and you become more tired quicker than if you have adequate light. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it, I know that like for... I would do a certain amount of paperwork, but most of my work would be on a computer. Mm. So, that, you know, the computer can have its own issues, but from a lighting point of view, ensure you have enough light and ensure the color temperature is a cooler color if you're trying to do, you know, if, if you're working. Okay, fantastic. And, then, and that can be just a bulb in a, in a table lamp. Yes, of course. No, brilliant. And then I suppose, is it the opposite then for space like a bedroom where you're trying to wind down where absolutely yeah absolutely. okay so you're going from so warm. Like, yeah 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 okay i remember um so if if you if you're trying to relax you want to be going back down to that two four hundred to two seven hundred mm -hmm. and the thing that there with that dynamic white stuff which we have done in offices let's say of coppers you have the facility to have that cool color temperature when the room has been used for um, concentrated time, mm. and then you have the facility to wind it back down if someone's just in there listening to music or whatever. Okay, fantastic, yes. And, and then with the Bluetooth bulbs, mm -hmm. you get that tonal value, like the hue and everything, so yeah. you can change the color temperature. Exactly, so one bulb can perform both. And one I bulb think, can do it all, yeah. So yeah. something like that would be fantastic if space is limited or if somebody is working from you know, one space that they then have to relax in in the evening or, or whatever. So exactly. that would be ideal. Yeah. So that, that's a great investment. Yeah. No, fantastic. Yeah. So we got one question, Rocky, just might jump to about lighting a bathroom. I'm sorry, you can't see this sugar. I can't show the whole thing. But this is actually where we use pendants either side. So they're asking how to light a bathroom if they don't want to use down lights. And what we did here either side of this uh, mirror, and I can share it after this actually in stories, was we just put two pendant lights. So, yeah. do you any other tips, maybe for a larger bathroom? This was a guest WC. Well, again, the, the the challenge we have in England and Ireland, in uh, difference to mainland Europe, is the regulations that govern and dictate what we can use in a bathroom are very, very restrictive. Mm -hmm. So, the pendants that you can use in a bathroom now. It's different in a toilet space, but a bathroom, you're quite limited, but you can use pendants. Mm -hmm. What I would say is to this person is that <clears throat> what we would always suggest to do, if you, if, if you think about what's in the bathroom, you've got the shower, the bathtub, the sink, and a toilet. So if you use those surfaces, and normally they're white, so, and they're very reflective. So we would always put some down lighting, not to light necessarily the room, but over the bathtub mm. and then that bathtub becomes a massive reflector mm -hmm. so you get all this indirect light bouncing back up and lighting the room mm. so to go back to the answer to your question you, there's you can have the pendants as you say you can have wall lights and then with what i discussed earlier about you know the first fix elements you know you can put in within the plaster board you can either put vertical line of light like a shadow gap in the corner or you can put it on the ceiling and then you have a washer light coming down the wall. Mm. The disadvantage to that is that, and uh, 
this is mean no disrespect to anyone, but if you bad tiling and you put down lighting or you wash that light mm. onto bad tiling, it looks horrific because you get all of these shadows going you on. So everything. what looks yeah. You see everything. Mm. So you have to be careful about that as mm. well. Mm. But the, there's lots of ways around. You can have, you know, if there's a standalone or if the bathtub is slightly removed or out from the wall, you can put in-ground up lighting, which mm. can be very nice if you're having a bath and you just want a little bit of light. It's almost mm. like you're having candlelight going on. And then you can have your pendants, you can have wall lights. And then the location, I would never sort of fill a bathroom in a grid with light. Again, locate where you want the light source to go. Mm. So you might have one over the sink, a couple over the bath, one in the shower. And then the big thing as well with niches in the in the shower cubicle, mm. use those as your light source. You don't need light in there. And, well, that, you know, exactly. when you're in the shower. Well, that's what yeah. we do a lot. So we would often do recessed mirrored cabinets. So we would have a slot. And again, I'll share it in the exactly. story. So we light that. And then we might have, say, at the back of a bath, another recess for displaying stuff and we use light there. And actually, in yeah. my own bathroom, they're the only lights I ever put on. Like, I rarely put on yeah. the, the overhead lights. So, um, it's, and it's a lovely way. They're emergency create. lights. Emergency lights, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Brilliant. And then we got another uh, question, just a lady asking for advice on um, lighting a space with a vault in the ceiling. She's asking for up lighters or anything that you might recommend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, vaulted ceilings, um, I think there's one image there I shared with you that looks up into, through an opening, if you might catch it. Uh, vaulted yeah. ceilings are, can, be, can be tricky, and it depends on two things. One, how high the vault is mm -hmm. and how big the room is. So if you're up lighting only into a space and it's a very large room, you're depending that the light bounces off that ceiling, bounces back down into the room. So the light is actually traveling twice the distance it probably would normally. And light dissipates very, very quickly mm -hmm. in its illuminated value, mm -hmm. in its lux levels. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it's very doable to use up lighting. And then sometimes you might have, depending on the vaulting, you might have beams going across, straddling either side of the vault. And you could use light in those to up light and create, and then you don't see them then when they're off. Oh, lovely. Okay. So depending yeah. actually on the construction of the vault, the height of the vault, um, and the size of the room mm -hmm. would dictate how you would do it. Um, sure. And it's very, you know, that's just making sure you have the right type of light source in the right place. Yeah. Okay. No, very good. Sorry, Rocky, they're not all, the images aren't coming up, but I just put this in this nice right. wall light with up and down uh, lighting on a staircase, which is very effective as well. So very yeah, nice, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, okay. And then um, you shared some fabulous images for external lighting uh, with me. So maybe just, we'll have a little talk about that because I suppose our gardens now are uh, places oh, that everybody's yeah. thinking about improving and working on. So lighting is such a wonderful way to add impact. Um, so well, nice it's funny energy. thing. I lit my garden during the COVID period for the first time ever. And really, it, Rocky? Oh my been, goodness! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the it's cobbler's like house. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah, but it's been brilliant. Like, and it worked really well. And um, so, the, what I always say to people in relation to landscape lighting and garden lighting is that we spend most of our time looking into the garden. Yes. You know, yeah. when it's dark. Yeah. When we're out in the garden, when it's dark, it's generally a barbecue. We've had a few glasses of wine. The lighting is irrelevant. Sure. So it's important to make sure that when you're investing in landscape or garden lighting, yeah. is you think about what am I going to see when I look out my living room, my kitchen, or whatever, mm -hmm. so that in, you ensure that the the and the best thing to do is to you know pick a really good shrub or really good tree or whatever it is that you you know that will look well from inside and light it really well mm -hmm. and that also helps like that particular photo you put up there so the idea there was we position that's the entrance mm -hmm. into that home so we position the light source to create that shadow effect on the house Lovely. So okay. that's a really nice thing to do that, you know, not only are you getting the illuminated, illuminated plant or shrub or tree, mm -hmm. but you're always getting this other effect going on. And it's Lovely. nice sometimes if 
you can create something different with light than when it's daytime. So obviously that sort of image only exists at nighttime. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that can be, it, you know, a, a really good thing to do rather than just getting light to illuminate safe passage or whatever it is, mm. you create something that's different that you just wouldn't see during the day. Yeah, it's gorgeous. No, really, really lovely. And I remember, Rocky, you said something to me that uh, when you're thinking about lighting your garden, you're not lighting it so that you can see everything. It's it's more about lighting the features, you know, that that's... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It, it's yeah. Not, not like when you're thinking... So about less is more, different. nearly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and this and is also is well. you can spend a fortune on lighting. So you've mm -hmm. got to, you know, and it's you know you have to dig up the garden, you have to get cables out there, you have to control it, blah, 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 blah. so it's ensuring that what you do makes sense mm -hmm. and also is is um, is visible and makes sense, works from inside as well as from outside. Mm. And and for me, I think that's the biggest thing is that you are looking out onto the gardens and particularly at night. And I know you have a lot to say on this topic, but if say, for example, you've got a lot of glass at the back of the house and suddenly at nighttime, you know, you're looking at this black glass, but by lighting your garden, it just opens up a whole other dimension and it's just fantastic. Yeah. It brings you through. So the big problem is that with, you know, double glazing and now triple glazing, mm. there's actually nearly three reflections going on there. Mm. And they can be quite um, eerie, but it, to break them down, the easy way to do it is just to have the illuminated area just beyond it or mm -hmm. that you've got this feature lit and suddenly your eye will be brought right through the glass. Yeah. yeah. As it's, um, it can be, in certain circumstances, that blackness in the winter can be very cold mm. and it can be very... Um, you know, it can be just horrible because all you see is yourself and you've all these reflections going on. And then the more light sources you have internally, then you have more reflections. So that's right. It's, yeah, no, yeah, it's a great way to break down yeah. that reflection. And then this, oh, shoot, I'm covering this one. I don't know how I can turn it around. But um, this is amazing. <laughs> I was actually looking at something similar myself. So this is a product. <laughs> I'll share this again. Apologies. Uh, where it's literally, uh, is it solar powered or battery operated, Rocky? But you can well, no, that, no. You hang it anywhere. Yeah, um, it's a hanging globe, but that yeah. one has mains power to it. Oh, does it? Okay. So the one I, it I looks was like the at, moon. Oh, it's beautiful because there are ones you can get. Um, I think it's just cartel make them, and you can literally hang them anywhere, and they just yeah, have yeah, these yeah. like these little glowing balls. So again, if you don't want to go down the route of um, digging up the garden with the wires. There's so many beautiful uh, battery operated lights that are really great now that you can get, which are fabulous. Brilliant. Well, Rocky, thank you so much. Uh, Jeepers. Very There's good. So much information. That went quicker there. than I thought. <laughs> yeah, well, if anyone needs anything, just, uh, you know, holler. There's no Reach problem. Out. Exactly. And what I'll try yeah. and do then on stories, I'll try and share a load more images just to illustrate, because I know there's Great. so much information there, but um, really, really worth uh, spending a bit of time and just getting it right. So, Rocky, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your week. Well, what, and you too, what I would just say there on the end of it is, you know, the mantra I have is you'll spend the same money doing a bad job as you will doing a good job. And it's all about the location and consideration of what the space has been used for mm -hmm. and where you locate the lighting. Definitely. All and right. starting early. The, and that's why the earlier, you know, to, to start thinking about these things, the better. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The Great. quicker you're in, the better the job. That's it. Rocky, thank okay, you so everyone. much. Thanks a million. Thanks thank everybody you so much. Take care. Yeah. Cheerio. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.